Welcome, Dr. Marouche, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Lorena Telles. I work at the Cardio Infantil Foundation, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you to our moderator for this event, Dr. Luis Carlos Sanz, Director of the International Arrhythmia Center. Welcome. Okay, muy buenas tardes. Eh, muchas gracias a todos por eh, su asistencia. Mi nombre es Luis Carlos Sáenz, soy cardiólogo, electrofisiólogo, director del Centro Internacional de Arritmias de la Fundación Cardiofantil y estará encargado de la moderación de esta actividad. Eh, le recordamos que al conectarse a esta conferencia autoriza al tratamiento de sus datos personales, los cuales, eh, lo, lo cual será hecho de acuerdo a la Ley 1581, de 2012 y nuestra política de datos personales, la cual puede consultar en www.cardioinfantil.org. De igual forma, le informamos que esta conferencia está siendo grabada. El chat de preguntas se encuentra habilitado en la barra de participantes. Les agradecemos dejar allí sus inquietudes, las cuales resolveremos al final de la sesión. Eh, queremos hacer un agradecimiento especial a Biosense Webster por vincularse como patrocinador exclusivo de esta actividad. Hoy eh, tenemos eh, el honor de contar con la participación como expositor del doctor Nasir Marouche con la conferencia Ablación eh, de Catéter para Fibrilación Auricular en Pacientes con Falla Cardíaca de la Evidencia a la Práctica Clínica. So, it is an honor for me to introduce uh, Dr. Nasir Marouche with the conference Catheter Ablation for Atrial Fibrillation in Heart Failure from Evidence to Clinical Practice. Dr. Marouche is graduated from University of Heidelberg, Germany, where he received his medical degree. Dr. Marouche completed uh, clinical clerkships at the, clinic, uh, the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, University of Bristol Harvard Medical School, and University of Washington School of Medicine. He went on to complete his residency in internal medicine and cardiology at Clinicum Coburg, Germany, And Dr. Marouche finalized his training with fellowships at the University of California, San Francisco, and the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. He's a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and Heart Rhythm Society. And Dr. Marouche is also a worldwide recognized researcher on cardiac electrophysiology and the PI of the biggest randomized control trial on catheter ablation for uh, atrophilation in heart failure patients, Castle AF. Currently, is a tenor professor in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine within the Department of Internal Medicine and an Executive Director at the Tulane Research Innovation for Arrhythmia Discovery Center at Tulane University and is the Director of uh, the Electrophysiology Division. Welcome, the, Dr. Marouche. Uh, you may start your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Luis. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today and to be with you uh, in uh, Colombia and uh, South America and Bogota, probably Luis uh, reaches beyond uh, Colombia as I know him. I met Luis the first time uh, when I was at Cleveland Clinic and there is a man walks into the room and said, how can I help changing the world? This is his first sentence out of his mouth. And uh, if I see him later today, 10, more than 10 years later, he is changing the world from uh, the Cardio Infantile Center in, uh, in the hospital in, in, in Bogota. Uh, we are proud of you and uh, hopefully we can continue working together on changing the world, uh, Luis. Uh, I'm sharing my screen, I'm not sure you can see it or not, maybe now? Now, now we can see it, yeah. Great. So I was asked to talk about catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation in heart failure from evidence to clinical perspective practice. Uh, let me start with, with two scenarios, with two patients uh, that all of you who is listening to me today uh, will deal or will see in their clinics every morning you wake up as a cardiologist or as an electrophysiologist. Patient A is a 62-year-old female with diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, EF less than 29, equal less than 29%, presented with New York High Class 2 symptoms. AFib, she's an amiodarone. Patient B, same age, male, diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, EF, 34%, and your high class three, AFib and amiodarone. 
if you ask, this is their ECG, there's a white complex QRS, EF is low, AFIP. Next step in management, and it's, I want to show you, it depends who you talk to. It really depends who you talk to, and you get different answers. You can switch them from either to another antiarrhythmic drug. You can refer for the electrophysiologist for AFib ablation. Refer to EP for heart or heart failure for CRTD. Add digoxin. Still happens today, by the way. Or continue current treatment and monitor. Which one you choose? If you ask the student who's rounding with you, medical student, that switch amidon to another antiretinal, let's try something else. If you ask the cardiology fellow, you tell let's send it to EP and heart failure. If you ask the treating physician, you know, the internist, he would say continue current treatment and monitor for symptoms and adjust the Lasix maybe and keep it going. Don't bother. If he's symptomatic, he doesn't feel it, no heart failure, don't worry about it. Improve the heart failure symptoms. But this patient, on both of them, if you follow the guidelines today, they need to refer to EP for AFib ablation. And let's tell you why. And let's tell you why not as well. So I'm going to tell you why you should send them, but I'm also going to tell you why not you should send them for ablation today. I want to start with this image, and this is an image which I believe, and we believe, is still underappreciated, underestimated today in our cardiology slash electrophysiology practice, the HL myopathy image. This is a 3D reconstruction of a left atrium of a patient with atrial fibrillation. And you can tell this the blue to blue is, this is tissue reconstruction. It's not the volume, it's a tissue. So blue is healthy tissue and green is fibrotic tissue, green and white. Transmurality we changes the color, but this patient have a significant amount of myopathy in the posterior wall and have some myopathy in the anterior wall, as you can tell as well. So it extends beyond small islands, not extensive, and around the mitral valve and the appendages involved as well. The reason I'm showing you this because that connection that's seen here is from the AFib detection to causing uh, heart failure and strokes. That's where this relationship starts. The myopathy, AFib, heart failure, and strokes. I want you to connect these four pictures together. One, two, three, four. All starts in that atrium where the myopathy starts, the shape is different, the extension and so on, and myopathy and function and leads to heart failure and strokes. I want you to think this way going forward. And if you ask everybody today why we treat atrial fibrillation, there's two reasons. Quality of life, we want the patients, our patients to feel better. And number two, to prevent morbidity and mortality. I want to show you data why and what are they for. We'll look at today. So what are our treatment options? The rate control strategy, which has still been applied using beta blockers and calcium antigens digoxin, but the most important one, the more data supporting the rhythm control strategy, especially after the last two years. Antiarrhythmic drugs, you know, we can use class three. Uh, drugs is the only one you can practically use. Class one is with, you should be careful, and obviously some people suggest, but if not, class three, antiarrhythmic drugs. Um, you don't, maybe ticosin if you can. Cardioversion and ablation. So this is a strategy to create and control a patient, but ablation is ultimately the goal. I want to show you why. Why catheter ablation is an adopted choice and why it's in the guidelines today as a 2A indication. The three reasons I want to discuss with you going forward, mortality and hospitalization benefit, quality of life and last but not least left in LVEF, ejection fraction improvement in the function of the ventricular after ablation. Let's start with mortality and, 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 and hospitalization. Luis Mont had a great paper published a while ago in 2014 in Sarah's trial where he showed Patients with ablation are superior, and the ablation are superior to ethnic drugs in terms of AFib uh, recurrence after ablation. That has been reproduced by uh, the CAMT AF from, from uh, Dr. Schilling in England and others. So we know that AFib and heart failure ablation improves recurrence compared to antiarrhythmics in multi center randomized trials. The attack trials from Andrea uh, and his team, they uh, took patient low EF less than 40% with devices and randomized them to I'm uterine versus ablation and they showed and they showed that ablation 
does improve EF, six minute walk, and quality of life. But as important, they show in secondary analysis, hospitalization benefit was significant, impressive relative risk reduction of hospitalization 45% and mortality as well, 56% reduction. As Luis mentioned at the beginning, the Council AF trial is the largest trial that we designed today and been existing and published looking at AFib and heart failure and ablation and randomizing them to ablation versus a, a standard of treatment, a standard of care in patients with AFib and heart failure. We took patients in EF at 25% and randomized them to ablation versus commercial treatment. And the inclusion criteria were symptomatic paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation, failure or intolerance or unwillingness to take antiarrhythmic because all patients come to your clinics and I don't want to do, take antiarrhythmic. So we included those two in, in Castle. And EF that 35% plus an ICD by V or do a chamber ICD. You know this by now, the study we published in 2018, we showed that ablation of atrial fibrillation improved the primary endpoint of composite of mortality, all-cause mortality, and worsening heart failure, heart failure hospitalization at follow-up with a 48% relative risk reduction. It's an impressive number, 48% if you ablate people with low AF and AFib. If you look at the mortality alone, there was a benefit which get the effect in two years later, around two years later, and if you look at the hospitalization alone, there was significant benefit if you wait longer. Actually, the, the hospitalization effect gets into effect immediately. It means you should update the patients as soon as you can. Cabana showed us as well in sub-analysis, the heart failure population do very well in terms of mortality benefit. Patient with heart failure in Cabana, and this is a paper published in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, circulation as well by Doug and his team, that they showed these patients do way better than patient without uh, 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 heart failure in terms of improvement and if you compare them in, in terms of ablation versus drugs. So heart failure patients did very well in Cabana and they showed mortality benefit in this patient population and hospitalization. We learned a lot from the recent trial presented by Kershaw, the East AF net trial, European trial, where they compared people with early onset AFib. And the reason I'm mentioning this, not because of the topic today, but this AFib ablation strategy or rhythm control strategy was highlighted, that's important, as early as possible. And I want you to think this way, as early as possible. So the randomized patients with early onset AFib to rhythm control as well as rate control. The median days since AFib diagnosis was only 36 days. And the majority of the patients, not the patient was asymptomatic, in fact, 70% of the patients were asymptomatic that two years. And if you look at the endpoint, there was a impressive, uh, uh, impressive significance in terms of the rhythm control strategy compared to the usual care, which is in this case was rate control. And mainly due to cardiovascular death and to stroke benefit. But one of the things that highlight an AF, uh, AF net trial, the ECF net, is that rhythm control led to, even in patients with heart failure, they have better improvement. If you look at the first plot, asymptomatic patients and obesity, the rhythm control was superior. The rhythm control was superior to rate control. Keep this in mind, in this, specifically in these three group patients, asymptomatic, heart failure, and obesity. Again and again, anyway, looked at AFib ablation or rhythm control in heart failure population, we showed the superiority. Now, rhythm control strategy in this patient population, and I want to show showing this slide here, which is one of my favorite part of the paper, is that around 8% and later 20% of the patients had an ablation procedure on the, uh, as part of their treatment rhythm control. And we have a drug, the Dradron or Maltag, that was used a lot as well in this patient population. So that's different to the Affirm trial. Right? Remember, Affirm from, published in 2000 in the Journal of Medicine that showed rate with rhythm control, there was no difference, but we did not have around 10 to 20% of our patients having ablation procedure. Number two, Multic was, as you know, Multic has been shown in this population to improve mortality, and that's why it's 20, around 20% of the patients have Multic on board, we keep this in mind as well. But going back, AFib ablation, rhythm control, and heart failure population, as I showed you before, 
is important. The rate control, as you've seen here, I see a lot of patients in rate control, remain in rate control without any intervention. Some of them have crossed over to ablation 7% in this trial, despite the fact we still saw them in the there. This is an important paper, although the way it was presented by uh, the team, North Worth and his team, is to show that the catheter ablation, that the effect that we saw on castle wasn't as big in, in, in Medicare population in America. So they took 10,000 patients and looked at a drug treated versus ablated in a massive database in real life. And actually showed that ablation is superior to drug treatment. So they look at people who have an ICD in Medicare reports, uh, on social security report, as you say, in Colombia, uh, ICD and heart failure, and looked who have an ablation not, and compared outcome in terms of mortality and hospitalization. And they showed it's similar to what we saw in CASA. That's interesting. So they're producing our CASA effect. But they showed that a lot of people were excluded because they have asymptomatic and others. But if the patient fit the criteria, impressive uh, uh, finding here to reproduce, although a 20% relative rate reduction, but 38% or 40% that we saw in CASA. Again, in real life, this is reproducible. Keep this in mind. How does gather ablation impact heart failure in terms of EF? I think the change, what we know, what we know from Castle EF does the EF. Ablation itself, you can you tell here, led in 65% of patients around to improvement in their EF to more than 35%. Keep that in mind. That's a big, big improvement. And it was much better than pharmacological treatment. Actually, the camera MRI study, one of my favorite trials in heart failure by Dr. Kistler and his team in Australia, they did an MRI scans at three months after the procedure, and they showed ablation was better than drugs in improving EF. But, but, and a big but, this, the but that they have is that improvement was associated with scar in the ventricle. Okay, keep this in mind. In camera MRI, in, in the attack trial, we showed a significant improvement as well in EF by two points at, at one year follow up. And also the quality of life, catheter ablation impacted quality of life. I can tell you, I can list here, including Castle AF, 12 papers that showed improvement of quality of life after catheter ablation. And this is a CAMP AF trial. Catheter ablation improves quality of life in terms. Uh, uh, and when compared to drugs, antiarrhythmic or rate control in patients with heart failure. Cabana showed the same in the, in, in, in the quality of an in, inpatient with heart failure as well as well normal uh, population without risk or history of heart failure, significant improvement in favor of ablation in terms of all the criteria of quality of life. So I have enough data. I mentioned only two papers here, but we have including Castle AF and CAMPT and CAPT AF and others showed superiority. All this together, and it's very proud and happy to announce, as mentioned in the new guidelines by ESC, that Castle AF really promoted the change in guidelines to do 2A indication for catheter ablation in patients for heart failure uh, and atrial fibrillation. Now, going back to my patient that I mentioned at the beginning, these two patients, they both underwent catheter ablation. Now, Uh, have, for example, uh, um, sorry, improvement of EF to 43% from 29%, no AFib recurrence, neurocal class improvement. Patient number two have EF not changed, AF recurred after a while. His symptoms stayed with three despite the AFib ablation. So I'm giving you two extremes of patients we deal with every day in our practice. One improved. One did not do well. And let's look at this. Which a heart failure patient with Asia AFib will benefit most from catheter ablation? And we need to start personalizing, individualizing, tailoring the treatment of AFib and heart failure to a specific patient. Let's go back to the Castle AF trial. We look at the people who survived and compare them to this. Why we don't compare this to the rest of the population? What happened to this population here that died? that did not survive, you know, around 35% around of patients. Or patients here did not have EF improved more than 35% of people. Why? We need to start asking ourselves and improve refined treatment in this area. 
The same thing here with the cancer from the from the life from the real life data. This is other patient not do well, do not improve. Why? Who are they? How can we know about them? What we know so far, and this is a paper published by Dr. Zones from Germany from Council AF sub-analysis. He took the data and looked at what was the indicator predictor of outcome? And he found that the earlier the symptoms, the early the symptoms of heart failure, the one and two, they did way better, way better than patients with three and four. Look at the green lines. That's impressive. So the earlier you ablate them, the better they do. And you ask yourself why, and there is data supporting that, right? This is, this is the numbers here of, of, of one and two versus three and four, 61% versus 41%, and you ask yourself why, and we have a lot of paper published showing that the higher the New York high class and the symptoms level, the higher the myopathy, the higher the dilatation, the higher the volume. So we know that for fact. So these people with advanced heart failure, this is the MRI scans, again, reconstructed of four patients with little myopathy, and with severe myopathy, we call the uterine classification one, two, three, four, or stages. These patients did not do as well. Uh, we know that higher end cardiac remodeling dysfunction, again, this is another beautiful paper in circulation heart failure, COVID 2016, creating LA total EF, LAVI, and LA stiffness to uh, neocardial class. So we know that. We also know that the ischemic etiology in uh, calcial AF and in other trials, scars were problematic in terms of outcome. Non-ischemic versus ischemics. And the question why we know this higher fibrosis, not only ventricle, but atrial. And this has been published by Dr. Mehmet Akaya a while ago. The more myopathy you have, the more atrial myopathy you see, the worse the outcome. So how can we refine selection criteria going forward for us together? for catheterization of AF turbine heart failure. So the proposal I started with the Grimm's and left atrium, I showed you this image before. I think we need to integrate personalization. We need to get what we call it here at Tulane. We need to work with on your identity. So we give you the atrial and ventricular or the cardiac passport, which is built out of tissue characterization, volume function, and MRI scan of your heart, atrium and ventricle. That's what we start with. We give you an HL passport and the ventricular passport or ventricular ident or cardiac identity. And we know for years now, uh, and this is a work by Mehmet, I looked at LA fibrosis and he said, the more, the, the more fibrosis you have, the worse the chance or the less the chance having AF, EF improvement after ablation. Although patient may still be in sinus, but the improvement does not correlate. Although the patient may be in, uh, in a fib, the improvement does not correlate, but, but the most powerful predictor was atrial myopathy in this study. That was reproduced by uh, Dr. Pirokowski and Kirsten from Dresden, where they looked at the same data and it showed the worse the myopathy, the less chance of improvement after ablation, atrial myopathy. That's important when you take this patient, and we're going to learn a lot, by the way, we're presenting this at ESC, at the late breaking trials and the sign myopathy and ablation, and presenting this end of August, and I hope to see you there as well. Ventricular myopathy, a lot of data has been published in that area, a lot. This is one of the most elegant studies I've seen, is the, the paper by Kistler, where he looked at LV myopathy at three months and at baseline, and showed that the people did very well have no less than 15% each ventricular scarring myopathy. This is a dilated chymopathy patient, non ischemics. So he's talking about the scar, which is every fibrosis. And I think ischemics does do well because of the myopathy, not because of the etiology per se, but I think the myopathy itself, the bigger the scar, the worse the outcome. And he showed this again and again. It's so another paper, uh, Colic. Where he did the LV, they, they did this uh, scans on their patients and they showed, you know, T1 mapping, strain imaging, that afib recurrence is associated with myopathy, not only the improvement, but the afib recurrence from the ventricular myopathy. And that's impressive to note. We showed this in, uh, in, in, in 
in Kassel as well. And that's the Professor Bachmann, my partner in crime in Kassel, my copy eye, who looked at the uh, patient with lower aphid burden and benefit, benefit the most after ablation. They do much better than others. And probably this is, as the paper has been published, I'm sorry it says in press here, has been published almost eight months ago now. And it shows that patients on ICD have less than 50% a burden. They do better than the patient who have more than 50% burden. So we all, we know all this together into that these patients, atrial myopathy, LV myopathy, AFib burden, neocotlas, EF plays a role, and that's important. Maintaining sinus rhythm as here with better outcomes as well. So that's connecting with the Brahman's paper. And you can tell here that primary endpoint is better if you keep patient in sinus rhythm or in burden less than 50%. As you can tell, these, these dark blue lines, these dark blue lines in terms of hospitalization, mortality, primary endpoint, Castle Lab showed us ablate, look at the ICD, add six months for up, bring the burden down. That's an important criteria for future prediction of mortality. So going back to the, my two cases, I presented patient A and patient B. Patient A, little myopathy in atrium, almost no scan the ventricle. He did well, she did well and improved at follow-up, although the burdens are the same in both. Patient B, massive myopathy in atrium and the ventricle. She did not do well at follow-up, although the burden is the same. We need to start looking beyond just the rhythm on the surface. We need to start being more analytics, more individualization, and personalization of treatment going forward. And that's the criteria we use here at Triad at Tulane. New York High class, atrial myopathy, ventricular fibrosis, or ventricular myopathy, and ejection fraction going forward. If you have burden data, we integrate them as well in terms of uh, trying to, to help us. We want to lower it down. But these are the four criteria of selection for patient into the treatment and that we took this and now we're designing, actually we're working with, with, uh, uh, with the DCC at, uh, at Cleveland Clinic and ourselves who initiated the study and we'll hopefully with NIH support the trial, a big trial. We're going to need more than 2000 patients. Um, uh, this is the endpoint, you know, this is the endpoint, so I'm a patient with endpoint, but we're going to randomize them, get an MRI scans, and randomize them to catheterization versus treatment. And this is an important need in each arm, three years for up, and, and go from there. I hope to report this data for you in the next five, six years, or maybe seven years. And the question would be which patient will benefit the most? And they're trying to show in a prospective fashion that patient with advanced myopathy, despite randomization, if you ablate them or not, they may do as better, or maybe not. The primary endpoint of all cause mortality hospitalization, secondary endpoint with AFI freeze interval, uh, AFI burden, stroke quality of life, and so on and so on. Again, to end and summarize what I wanted to share with you today, there's clear benefit if you took a randomized trials of catheter ablation in half breath, patient with heart failure and reduce ejection fraction in terms of mortality, EF improvement, and quality of life and burden reduction. But not all AFib patients, heart failure patients, if they benefit from catheter ablation, I want to make this clear. And you, you agree with me, I hope you do agree with me, everybody listening today. But we need a, a larger heart failure trials, including the half population as well, to, this, to answer this question. I hope collectively together we can involve you on this and answer the question as a cardiovascular community and heart failure community. Why? Because Council AF2 will be driven by my colleagues in heart failure as well at Cleveland Clinic, like a step in steam. And we hope we together, we can answer this question. Luis, thank you enough. Thank you again for inviting me, having me part of your uh, grand rounds. And I would die to be back there in person as soon as I can in, in Bogota, one of my favorite countries in South America, maybe in the world, by the way. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nasir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. So thank you very much uh, for your excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, very, very important messages, not just for EPs, but, but also for, for uh, Tunisians. 
So uh, I want to remember uh, to remind to the audience that you can send the questions through the chat. And uh, I want to start uh, by asking you, Nasir, uh, about uh, the application of East AF study that, as you know, was recently published demonstrating the benefit of early rhythm control therapy strategy, including antiarrhythmic medication and catheter ablation in, in atrophy relation patients recently diagnosed. So based on, on Castle AF data and your clinical experience, do you think we could apply the same concept in heart failure patients, maybe considering catheter ablation uh, uh, earlier, uh, as, for example, as a first line therapy? What is your practice in, 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 in that? That's, uh, that's an excellent question. That's an okay. excellent question. Uh, excellent question. I, I tried to highlight this message, um, Luis, as well. If you look at the CalCELF population, 70%, 68% of the patients, did not have antiarrhythmic drug used because they refused to take it to have the contraindication. So uh, take that message, the patient had been ablated, add to that the ESAF trial findings and, and, and even Cabana, although Cabana have a failed one drug or a beta blocker, but ESAF, you see that early intervention plus the data from Castle that early symptoms are important. The, the moment they have symptoms, they ablate them immediately. They do better than the people with later symptoms. So applying this plus looking between the lines and castle, that fits very well. The message you need to intervene as soon as possible. What we're learning, and there's a study actually published, I, I did not present the Captain Myers from Dr. Uh, from Lara Chan, who was with us from Shanghai. She looked at the antiarrhythmic drugs versus rate control in calcium AF without ablation and showed there's no difference. So you're giving drugs antiarrhythmics and, maintaining sinus with antiretic, but you're wasting, you're wasting your time because the myopathy is increasing, the symptoms are increasing, and you're losing, uh, the, uh, the losing the window to have a better outcome. That's why I'm saying the early the symptoms they have, try to intervene assuming, because we assume that the earlier the symptoms, the better the myopathy images will be or the infiltration in the atrium and the ventricle. That's why, that's what we learned from an ECF trial, back that concept up is like, yes, intervene as soon as possible. And the heart failure patient in that trial are the best forest plots you've seen in ECF. They did the best compared to the others. The earlier intervene without wasting your time with antiarrhythmics and medication, the better your outcome will be. Okay, okay, great. So. Nasir, you, you, you showed us uh, uh, certain analysis data suggesting that some factors could predict better outcomes, right? In, uh, for catheter ablation of atrophilation in heart failure patients with uh, reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. As you mentioned, lower functional class, non ischemic cardiomyopathy. I, I lost you. Can, you. can you hear me? Luis? Lower to making process in sicker patients in I, which I, the benefit of sorry, Luis, I, I, lost, is that I, I lost you, Luis, for uh, for three seconds. I just got you back. I could not hear you. You stopped. You're frozen on me. Okay, can you, any question, please. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, now I can. Uh, okay, Nasir, you, you, you presented uh, uh, a sub analysis data showing that. Some I'm sorry, Luis, I lost you. I'm not sure you can hear me. I lost you. The shared decision-making process in seeker patients in which the benefit of catheter ablation is not that clear. So how, how, how is your interaction with other, uh, I mean, teams like, like, like uh, heart failure, uh, cardiology clinics, et cetera, to, to make this decision in, in seeker patients? That's, yeah, that's, that's a very tough decision. As you know, this is population in New York high class stage D and C, or uh, heart failure symptoms of three and four. It's a very hard decisions of those when they are sick patients. So what we try to do uh, with this population, our recommendation is we try to manage them symptomatically and by reason improve the symptoms level to three, at least at two plus before we take them to the lab. Sometimes the heart failure population, the heart failure doctors, you know, around us, they want us to intervene as soon as possible because they can rate control the patient, for example, 
or they want us to ablate the AV node, which is we don't like to do. We go and do an atrial ablation rather than an AV node because they have ICDs and others. But the decision has been, been made together with heart failure doctors. I agree with you. This is very important. But the advanced population, that's a, that's a challenge. In my opinion, not only my opinion, our opinion has been all the data generated. The more myopathy they have, the, the more challenges we have. And we need to collectively, as heart failure docs, as an EPs, look at this population, try to avoid, avoid have, having them getting that far advanced in the terms of myopathy level, in the atrium and the ventrum. The sooner you can leave the smaller the scar, the better you treat with them. If they are advanced, we try, full disclosure, if we have the symptoms improved, if the patients off pressors and we take them lab and give them a shot because we want to try. There's nothing else to try today, but unfortunately, uh, the outcome is not impressive in this population with advanced heart failure, advanced level of scarring. But important for us, as you mentioned in the question, that we involve our health failure docs in this discussion. They are part of the treatment and we need to engage them because they have the patients. And that's what, as an EP is in America now, we're struggling with. We have all the data that we generated, but we're struggling convincing our heart failure colleagues that this works and that's a reality. So now we, the next studies we're designing with Castle 2 will be led by heart failure docs. They will be leading it with us. And they will be randomizing the patients, not EPs only per se, because they need to be part of the game. And that's something we neglected over the years. Now it's, we're getting more success, although full disclosure, their level, the threshold of sending patients to us when they struggle with AFib is very low now. In the past, you used to wait and wait. Now they're sending more patients faster, but we like him to send them as a first-line therapy because the patient need to be treated early on, not later on in the heart failure progress. Okay, okay, thank you. There is a, a, another question here. Uh, maybe it's by an EP. Uh, Dr. Maroyush, could you describe what are the pre-procedural tests and preparation protocol you use in those heart failure patients planning to undergo catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation? Oh, we do it. We do an image. And this is, I mean, this is the question. To look at the myopathy in the cardiac MRI, that's what we do. We look at the cardiac MR and, and look at the myopathy. That's all we need in our patient. Obviously, this is a heart failure patient, so we have all the data from the heart failure doctor, right? You have the echo, you have the angiogram already done, and this patient is, uh, but for, for New York High Class 2, a level of symptoms, that's standard questionnaire and the staging, but we like to have an MRI scan done to detail the atrial and ventricular myopathy before we take them to the lab and uh, try to treat this patient based on these findings. So that's the only image and I add a test from EP perspective, and after that is an EP procedure straightforward as you as you oh, oh, Okay, Nasir, there is another comment from uh, one of our colleagues in our team, and it is about the fact that in, in Castle AF, uh, the lesion set, the technique, you know, to ablate atrofibrillation was under decision of the operator. So could you describe what is your technique to ablate, uh, ablate those patients, our failure patients? By the way, this is, very, this is a very important question. This is, thank you for this question, because this is very important. And you're going to learn a lot about this question in DCAF 2 when we present at the end of the month, end of, uh, uh, end of August. Because DCAF 2 took uh, 52 physicians around the world, experienced physicians, 1,000 patients, and did MRIs on them before ablation, after randomized them to MRI versus none. And you'd have all lesions. And what you're going to learn, your, by your question is very important. Everybody has his own approaches. It's very hard to standardize approaches, but you'll see, we'll share with you the outcome and so on in, 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 at the SC. In Castle AF, we have two boxes. You fill two boxes, you ask based on the procedure. One is PVI only or PVI plus, okay? 48% of the patients, 49, had PVI only. And the rest of the population of the patients had PVI plus. And there was no difference in terms of mortality between these two groups. This makes sense. 
So if you did PVI only or PVI plus, there was no different hospitalization and mortality in cancer. That's important. Although this is old, I mean, imagine we started recruiting in 2008 and 9. So Council F told us if you want to follow Council F ablation protocol, PVI is as good as the rest based on 2008, 2019. Obviously, we changed it all. Now, DCAF2 don't show us this. Does ablating myopathy important or not? Uh, there's the rotors and there's others in ablating. There's other studies coming out. I today, I look at uh, PVI, I look at the myopathy in the posterior wall and anterior wall, if it's confined, it's localized and ablate them. Uh, if it's too extensive, I, I don't follow it extremely, but I localize my myopathy approach. The challenge I have based on my images after three months is lesion formation. And that's a challenge we're working on. How to form a lesion on top of the myopathy. It's not the same as normal tissue, it's different, different beast. And I want you to think about this as well. So we try, we use the thermal cool irrigation that, that, that you presented at the beginning from Biosense. Uh, we use a, a, a deflectable sheet to be constant and not move. The Visigo sheet, for example, has been very helpful for us. And we try to these lesions based on certain criteria and, and we use high power, obviously short duration, but it's getting more and more of the duration because when I go through this scarring, it's been a really challenge. If this answers your question. Okay, thank you. There is another question here in the chat. Uh, could you use atrial sizing in echocardiography to predict atrial fibrosis and discriminate patients for catheter ablation when we do, do not have a cardiac MRI available? That's uh, another great question. And to be honest, believe me, and Luis, Luis knows that. Uh, he and me in every meeting we meet, we discuss that. Uh, you, can't, you can't do something in medicine without scaling. And MRI has been a challenge to scale. And that's a problem. And we're working with GE and Philips and our science. And now there's probably from outside our lab, there's another, I would say 62 labs have been publishing atrial myopathy and imaging. But it's, it's continuing to be a challenge. We're working on echo criteria and other to, to standardize on making an absolute Siemens, for example, there's a new sequence is making the MRI 40% faster, more standardizable. So this is coming. The, unfortunately, from the echo perspective, there's a paper we published a while ago in Utah, 2009, which showed the strain, LA strain, as a global strain is predictable for outcome. But there's no cutoff to standardize and, and select patients and find them or target ablation. Unfortunately, because it's not localized, it's just one strain criteria we did. Because the thin wall that we took the septum and the anterior wall, that's all we could. So volume, unfortunately, is predictive. If it's more than six centimeters, they're huge. Predictive. If it's smaller than 5.5 and less, it still could be, if you get back to sinus or in my position, it doesn't have to be that large. It depends where you are. In your, but if it's in sinus and more than 5.5 to 6 centimeters, then you can be sure there's a myopathy. But if it's less than that, uh, and in AFib, for example, our data does not show a correlation, very strict correlation with the amount of myopathy or strain in MR. Okay. Uh, there, is, there, there are another questions about post-procedural care. So one question is, what is your protocol and use it technology to follow uh, heart failure patients after catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation in order to verify impact on outcomes and atrial fibrillation burden? Uh, our protocols, if they have an ICD, it's easy, right? It's heart failure patients, we follow the burden. And I want the burden to be less than 50%. I'm not accepting anything less than more than 50% because I have mortality data now. That's an endpoint for me. If they're asymptomatic, if they're symptomatic, straightforward, get them back and treat them. But if they're asymptomatic, the burden of 50%, get them back and ablate them. Heart failure population. Not heart failure population, we do a lot of patches now here in our clinic. The patch, four weeks. We use digital health devices in everybody. We have two protocols working. Everybody gets healthy, but we do PP, PPG on, on the watches, on the wristbands. This is part of our protocol as well. Uh, we're adopting this. We like burden now, and burden becomes the new standard. 
as you know. Uh, so look at burden, lower your burden. That should be new endpoint. And don't follow the 30 seconds rule anymore. Unfortunately, we have to put it in the protocols and studies to standardize it. But now it's the burden is a new, the new black, as you would say. The burden is a new black. So uh, that's, that's what we standardize it. So we monitor people a lot. Uh, and our threshold lowering, if the MRI is, is good in terms of myopathy, we tend to stop uh, blood thinners even at six months. Okay, great. There is another question here from, from uh, one of our uh, fellows. Is how long do you wait when a patient had a recent heart failure decompensation, decompensation until you consider it's safe to ablate at a fibrillation? How, how long, sorry, I, I feel the, how long? I, I mean, how long time you, you, you plan to wait uh, uh, to perform atrophilation uh, catheter ablation procedure in a patient indicated to undergo the procedure, but with a recent descompensation from heart failure? Until, until, until I compensate him, I compensate him. I get them back to New York Hacks 2. Diuretics, when he's okay, take him to the lab immediately. Don't wait. He will come back next week for the conversations immediately. Diarrhea him, improve his symptoms, and take him back. Bring him from three to two and bring him down to the cat lab. Okay, again, again, if it puts one more message I want to highlight on top of the selection, the earlier the better. Not only in terms of AFib burden, AFib, but the earlier the better in terms of myopathy, the earlier the better in terms of symptoms, the earlier the better. Okay. Okay, there is another question here is, is there, I mean, do you consider is there enough evidence to do cardiac MRI prior to catheter ablation in every patient planning to undergo the procedure? Yes. I, I support your answer. Yes. Yes. I mean, there, there's enough evidence, but you know, it's, uh, unless you as a physician convinced that evidence means nothing. You need to be convinced. The person who's asking this question needs to be convinced that helps you in your patient management. I mean, 80% of the procedure we do is because we, you know, swear on the, on the book that we will do the best for our patient. If I'm convinced, I'll use it. Evidence that there's enough papers. There is today 160 papers, we counted them, showing myopathy, fibrosis, and MR predicts stroke, predicts outcome, predicts recurrence. But if you're not convinced, uh, it, this all doesn't mean anything. Because you want to do the best to your patient when you walk to the lab. I want to see what I'm dealing with before I go to the lab. I want to see what uh, management does have a chance, that's expectation. Don't I stop my blood thinners based on the myopathy image? Uh, I target the myopathy. I mean, this, it's a whole story. And uh, we use it uh, routinely in echocardiograms, right, uh, to assess indication for ICDs and, and so on. But based on EF, this very subjective measure. Why not, why not the myopathy measure with the tissue characterization measure as the next step and predicting strokes and start closing the appendage, for example. That's a study we're doing now. It's, there's an indication to close the appendage or maybe to blood thinner early on. So that's why I think the future is beyond the AFib itself. And that's what hopefully we'll see at Castle 2. It's, 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 it's leading myopathy and how you and me can target that uh, myopathy with ablation or maybe drug or maybe something else. We're doing studies now here with, with antiarrhythmics with the Malta. Okay. So that's, yes, you have to be convinced yourself. There's enough evidence in my perspective, but you have to be convinced that the evidence is satisfies you out there. There's all the papers, yeah. Yeah, N Nasir, there is a, another question here. Can you please give us, if possible, a preliminary result of the CAF2? Please. <laughs> I, will lose the, I will lose the presentation with fire from ESC. And, and New England Journal will not take the paper probably. So I have to be careful. Okay, okay. Um, there is a, a question related with uh, atrophilation burden. As uh, obviously we now, I mean, the, 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 the total medical community accept that we have to move the endpoint 
of the catheter ablation procedure from a binary definition of presence of or absence of 20 seconds atrial fibrillation recorded to declare successful or not the procedure to the measurement of atrial fibrillation volume, right? So based on that, do you think every single patient undergoing catheter ablation with heart failure uh, has to undergo also implantation of implantable loop recorder, yes or no? Uh, that's, that's a tough question. If, you, if, you, if the patient would like to have something below the skin small enough, I would take it. But I think we have tools. We have implantable recorders, we can use them. I, I, I would like you to have as much burden data as you can. How you get it is up to you. There's implantable devices. Can we uh, do this in 300,000 patients per year? We have to debate it. Uh, but there's tools like this. Snapshots every PPG curve, every this, this watch or the, or the Samsung watch or Fitbit watch will record every five minutes and you can buy a watch for $15 now. Uh, patches every three months continuous recording. We have a lot of digital health tools that we never had before to record all this information. Uh, Ideally, implant device for continuous monitoring, but this is being replaced by wristbands now. And if you get the 60% of your day to 70% of the day with data versus nothing that we have today, that's an important data. To answer your question simply, yes, I would love the continuous monitoring forever, but why should I have a chip for me if I can do it non-invasively? I can continue monitoring myself. So that's a question we need to answer. And the, and the other good news is that these monitors getting smaller and smaller and tinier and tinier probably will have a, a single chip after you, you, you are under your arm and then will be the rest. So yes, I would like to monitor as much as you can. It's up to you where you live, which country, which state, which hospital, because now hospital, some hospital doesn't allow you to do this uh, for you and everybody, uh, but you need to monitor as much because burden is the outcome, not the occurrence anymore. Okay. Uh, this is maybe the last question is here. Um, could you, could you describe, I mean, yeah. Do you consider, uh, the benefit of catheter ablation of heart failure patients with atrophilation, uh, is sustainable along the time? Um, if you look at the data from, from Castle and the remodeling after ablation, it's really impressive. We have five years for updated. Volume, pump function, improvement in EF. It's very impressive. Uh, I think it is. I think it's the same amount of time, but not in everybody. When we say it, I showed you an example of two patients I presented. I selected them clearly to show you that people doesn't do well, but the others do well. And you and me and everybody listening to us, we deal with the follow-ups, with the complications, with the recurrences. We see those in our clinics again and again and again. I will forget that we want to do it well. Uh, but the majority, uh, they do well, and the improvement is lasting, long lasting, impressive. I mean, we're having 10 years full up data now on, on AFib patient ablations and, and heart failure, and the, and the improvement is, has been impressive. But again, you need to differentiate is the LV function deteriorating because of the AFib or because of myopathy? And that's why I think the coronary disease patient, the ischemic patient, the progressive disease, they not do well. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter what you do with the AFib, they're progressing, the fibrosis is progressing. And that's what we're trying to do now with the EDORA trial, the multi ablation trial. We started now, again, it's 15 sites to look at suppression of the myopathy after ablation. So I think there's patient profit. It's long lasting, but the question is how can we stop progressing of fibrosis based on disease? And that's something we have to answer. Okay, okay, Nasir. Uh, maybe you can end uh, the, this great session. We learn, learn a lot uh, by proposing now last key take home, home message for our, our audience, uh, Nasir, just to say goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. And Luis, again, th thank you uh, for being a, a, a leader and a driver, in, in not only in South America, globally, in liquid management and everything. We're so happy for your success and, and, and your center. But also one take home message for my lecture today, guys, treat as early as possible in terms of symptoms, 
in terms of burden and in terms of uh, myopathy. Treat as early as possible. I think we have an update to support this. Don't lose time with antiretinics and prophylactic treatment. Just intervene as early as possible with the catheterization and pursue maintenance science living in a living health care. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Ray, Nasir, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us in these round rounds. And um, we learned a lot, as I said before, and we really hope to see you in person very soon in our institution, uh, participating in one of our uh, multiple academic activities that you use to scale them along the year. So thank you very much. Uh, and muchas gracias a, a todos por acompañarnos, a todos los participantes por su asistencia. Y nuevamente muchas gracias a Maestros Webster por su apoyo para el desarrollo de esta conferencia. Y hasta una próxima oportunidad. Thank you, Nasir. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.